Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts and minds be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God, our Heavenly Father, who gives us every good and perfect gift. Amen. The year was 1992, and the world was introduced to a song by Gatorade based on NBA legend Michael Jordan. The song was titled, Be Like Mike. And some of you may remember it today. Some of you may have hummed it in your head right now. Sometimes I dream that he is me. You've got to see that's how I dream to be. I dream I move. I dream I groove like Mike. If I could be like Mike. Oh, yeah, I want to be like Mike, like Mike. I want to be like Mike. And as a boy growing up, I hear that song, see that commercial, the Gatorade commercial on TV. I wish I could be like Mike. I wish I could be Michael Jordan. So I would go out and I'd try to emulate being Michael Jordan. I'd grab a basketball, go out to the driveway, try to do a shimmy, a little fadeaway game-winning shot as the game clock expired. And yet, I never did become Michael Jordan. I knew that even though I dreamed even though I would drink as much as Gatorade as I could, I never could become Michael Jordan. We often can't be what we aspire to be. We often fail. We fall short of the expectations that we set for ourselves. And failure happens to us quite often in this world and in this life. Confusion overtakes us. And there was a sense of failure, there was a sense of confusion on that first Easter evening. The disciples were there gathering together, discussing the testimony that they had just received from fellow friends who were traveling to Emmaus. And upon that road, a stranger walked with them. And there, when they got to Emmaus, they broke bread. And that stranger, it turned out, was Jesus Christ himself. And he opened their minds. And everything, everything was different. Those people fled back from Emmaus to back to Jerusalem to let the disciples know they had seen the risen Lord. Jesus was alive. He was alive in the flesh and blood. And his disciples gathered there in that upper room, hearing from those open minds of the travelers that Moses, the prophets, all of Scripture had to say about Jesus and who he was. They trembled in fear. Could it really be? Can it be that Jesus did raise from the dead? He's alive and in the flesh? Oh boy. And if that's true, if He is risen from the dead, what is He going to do with us? What is He going to do with us, His disciples, who left His side there on the Mount of Olives, who fled as fast as our feet could carry us? What is He going to do to us? What's He going to do to us? who stood at a distance watching Him die on the cross as He shed out His innocent, precious blood. What's He going to do with us? What is Jesus going to do with us? We have rejected Him. We have turned away from Him. And so it is with us. We rejected Him. We turn the other way living in fear, living according to the world and not according to the Word. And then Jesus entered their midst in that locked room. And He spoke to those disciples. And He speaks to us. People who have failed and are confused. And this is what Jesus had to say to His disciples and He has to say to you. Peace to you. Peace. Not like the world would have. No, it's not that let's just all just get along. Let's just coexist. No, it's not that kind of peace. The peace that Jesus gave to His disciples actually calmed their troubled hearts. It calmed their anxious spirit. Because why? That peace was from God Himself. And Jesus calls out to His disciples and He tells them, Come, touch Me. Touch my hands. Touch these wounds by which you are healed. But not only did Jesus tell them to come and to see His wounds of victory, He enlightened them upon whom He really was. Who He really is. 
The translation we read in Luke 24, verse 39 was this. See my hands and my feet, it is I myself. But that loses the important fact of who was talking and who was actually standing there in the presence of the disciples on that night. The Greek words at the end of that verse are as follows. Ego e mi autos. Rendering literally as this. I am I myself. The knees buckle. The jaws hit the floor. Ego e mi autos. It's amazing the disciples didn't fall over and faint just at that moment because when they heard those words, they knew whose presence they were standing in. I am. I myself. They were in the presence of Yahweh. They were there standing in the presence of the Lord in the flesh. They knew their Old Testament history. They knew no one could stand in the presence of the Lord and live to tell about it. But here they were, standing in the presence of Jesus, and Jesus tells them, Peace be to you. Moses saw just the backside of the Lord, and he was left with a glow so strong that he had to be covered in a veil. And here were the disciples standing in the presence of the Lord, and he was telling them to come forward, face to face, look at him, look at his wounds, and touch them. There was Jesus, God himself standing in the midst of letting them see and touch those wounds of victory. Luke uses an interesting phrase to describe the disciples at that point. He says this, they still disbelieved for joy, and they were marveling. Love that. It's kind of an awkward phrase, disbelieved for joy. It's similar to our modern day expression, this is too good to be true. They were in awe and amazement that Jesus really was there, standing in their midst. He is the great I Am, the Lord God Himself, standing there and calling out to them, Peace, come, touch and see. They were in awe and amazement of who He really was. And yet, He came to them to give them peace. So we hear what Jesus did for the disciples. He explained how all the dots were finally connected. The law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, it all pointed to him being the fulfillment of the promised Messiah. He dove into the word and he opened his disciples' minds that night that the word was always about him, Jesus, from Nazareth, was the Christ and is the very Son of God. So the disciples listened and they finally got the straightforward answer that they needed about who Jesus is and what their place was in this unbelievable and yet true event. This is no fairy tale story. This is the God honest truth. They were there in the presence of God and they learned who Jesus was. Luke goes on to write, Thus it is written, Jesus tells them that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in His name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Note there what Jesus directly tells His disciples. You are witnesses. You know the truth. You know what the law of Moses spoke of. You know what the prophets foretold. You know what the Psalms described. All of it was pointing to Jesus. And now you are witnesses to these things. The disciples were to witness. To witness. To give testimony. To tell. To speak out about who Jesus is and what He has done. The message was simple it was true and pure. It was always about Jesus. Proclaiming Christ the crucified and yet the risen Lord. But there would be opposition to this. 
there would be temptation to make Jesus out to be something that He is not. There could be that chance to take that pure Gospel message and taint it with the twist that we want to put on it. But we see in the reading of Acts, the people were astounded at the healing of Peter and John that they gave in Jesus' names. The crowds began to wonder and pound, ponder how they did and by what power they did this. Was it of their own power and piety? But Peter proclaimed Christ and Him crucified and risen. He told of the promised Messiah, that same God of Abraham, God of Jacob, and God of their fathers. He was the innocent one who gave up His perfect and righteous life on the cross so that they could have forgiveness of sins. And as Peter proclaimed Christ the crucified and risen, hear what he says to those multitudes of the crowd there in the middle of his address in the book of Acts. And to this... We are witnesses. That's why this morning we first heard the Gospel message. We first heard Jesus telling His disciples, you are witnesses. And we followed that Gospel reading with the reading from Acts chapter 3. And as Peter de declares, we are witnesses. The direct connection that Luke writes there in both his Gospel account and in the book of Acts shows what the importance of these readings are. Christ the crucified. Christ the risen Lord. Christ as the author of life. Christ who forgives us our sins and gives us eternal life. The focus always has and will be Jesus is Lord. He was doing what Jesus Christ foretold in Luke 24. For Peter was being that witness to who Christ is. He was bringing all attention and all detail on what Jesus had done. He wanted hearts to turn in repentance, to have their sins blotted out, and those times of refreshment be brought forth. No, it wasn't time for Gatorade. It wasn't time to be refreshed in that way. It was time for Jesus, as it always is and will be time for Jesus in our lives. John reiterates this message in a different way in his epistle writing from 1 John. He writes about the love of God. That love of the Father which He has given to us, us children, children of God. It's not like the world knows or gives. For that love, it's been tainted of our own wants and our own desires. It isn't the true love of the Father. John writes what that love really is. For the love of the Father, the love that He gives, it is pure, it is holy, it is perfect. For the love that He gives is the love of Christ. The love of the cross which Christ was on, pouring out His love with every drop, which every heartbeat which sent blood out from His veins. That is what the love of the Father is. The love of the Father is that on the third day, Christ rose victorious from the grave. The tomb could not contain Him. For the love of the Father is our living Lord Jesus. But there's a problem that John brings up. The reason why the world does not know us is that it doesn't know Him. It was a problem then and it's still a problem with us today. The reason why the world does not know is that we don't say. We don't tell out about Jesus as that pure Gospel message says. Christ suffered for you. He died for you. He rose for you. God gave up His one and only Son for you so that you may have forgiveness and refreshment so that you may have life everlasting. And for this, you are witnesses of. You have a witness to tell. Sadly, we make Jesus out to be something that He is not. We direct the focus back on our ways and our wants instead of the purity of the Gospel message. We make it out to be some cheap grace or about prosperity or personal vendettas being solved instead of being a witness of what it truly is and always will be. Jesus is the Christ. If one is caught lying during a trial or under oath, it's called perjury. You and I, though, we don't need to be 
making Jesus out for something he is not. We do not need to be caught in perjury. We know the truth. We know the truth that the world so desperately needs to hear. We have been given the truth that this world needs to know. And the truth is Christ the crucified. Christ suffered, he died, he rose, he lives. That's the pure gospel message this world so desperately needs and that this world will know us by. Not by our hands or actions, because by our hands and actions, as Peter professed, we killed the author of life. But by his hands, he gave us eternal life. The truth is simple. Repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in His name to all nations. Declare His glory among the nations. People need to hear that by our human hands, we cannot be saved. But if we repent, Jesus will forgive us our sins and give us eternal life in and through Him. For God has given us love. He has given us His Son. He has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. He has given us His Word, which testifies to that truth to make us all witnesses. For you are witnesses. I am a witness. And our witness is Jesus. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the very Son of God. He is who God foretold by the mouth of the prophets. He is the one who was foretold by the law of Moses. He is the one who is described by the Psalms. For Christ suffered, and he fulfilled all that was written about him. The good news is, we don't have to be like Mike. We don't have to be Jesus. There can be only one Jesus and he lived 2,000 years ago for you. He suffered and died 2,000 years ago for you. He rose victorious from the grave 2,000 years ago for you. And he lives in the flesh today for you. And that is what we are a witness of. We are a witness to what he has done for you, for me, and for this whole world. And we can live lives that point not to ourselves, but lives that point to him, Christ the crucified and risen Lord. We can spread that reign of God the Lord in all our various vocations of life as we proclaim, Christ is risen! He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And our witness is the Christian faith that we confess day in and day out. Our witness is the confession that we now proclaim as we confess that Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Please stand as we confess together as we are witness to the faith of Christ. For I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. You are witnesses to that faith. That is your witness throughout this life and in the life to come. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now the peace of God that passes our human understanding. Keep our hearts and minds in that pure gospel message now and forever. Amen.